Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Matthew. Um, at two o'clock this afternoon, I was sitting at my desk, aware that there was something I had to do, but unable to remember what it was. I thought ahead to tonight, to this very moment, and it came to me. It was the thing that I'd been putting off for days, for weeks. I had to write my speech. Why do we put things off if we know we'll have to do them eventually? It doesn't make sense. Why was I sitting at my desk two weeks ago doing my accounts when I'd promised myself last year that next year, i.e. this year, I wouldn't leave it until the last minute? Why did different people put different things off? Some people put off doing the washing up, whereas, as my wife will tell you, I'm so keen to do the washing up, I'll usually make a start on it before we've even sat down to eat. I think my wife finds that unrelaxing. Whereas I can't relax if I know that there's a pan sitting there on the side with food congealing all over it. I mean, at least you've got to get those pans into soak. Am I right? <laughs> I started planning this speech weeks ago by asking my fellow judges for their impressions of the judging process. My plan was that they would basically write my speech for me. <laughs> which Jonathan more or less did. He started by saying that judging a large short story competition is an exercise in immersion. It's like standing under a waterfall and letting yourself get drenched in other people's words. I like that, I thought. That's good, I'll use that. <laughs> or, he went on, no it's not. Oh, great. <laughs> it's like walking into a warehouse at night, he wrote, and wandering the aisles, opening box after box. Nice, very atmospheric. What it's not like, he said, is being in a bookstore. There are no covers, no author photos, no bios, no marketing pitches. An author can sell themselves to a certain extent, he continued, <laughs> through their formatting. Making sure your story looks professional can't hurt. That reminded me of the entry that we got one year that was handwritten and not very legibly handwritten. The entry we got another year in Comic Sans. <laughs> Frankly, I prefer handwriting. <laughs> and although this isn't strictly a formatting issue, the entry this year that took a cavalier approach to following the rules on maximum word count. <laughs> Our maximum word count is 2,500 words. I had one entry in my batch this year that seemed to be going on and on and on and on. I checked the word count. It was 33,564 <laughs> words. Reading literally hundreds of, sto of short stories like this, Jonathan went on, offers proof that there is no such thing as the perfect short story. Although, I think our six finalists this year come pretty close. And so have our shortlisted stories in previous years, and many of the unofficially long-listed stories too, those that we highly commend in a list published each year on the competition website. But I do know what Jonathan means. I always remember, when J I always remember what James said to me uh, when we started the competition in 2009, and I told him I was feeling overwhelmed by the sheer number of entries. You're looking for a story, he said, that's worth 10,000 pounds. You do need to bear that in mind. It does focus uh, the mind. It is a life-changing sum for a writer, for anyone, uh, but perhaps especially for a short story writer. I'd love to see some research on the average payment for a published short story in this country, or anywhere in the world. I'm guessing it would be about £2.50. <laughs> Sakina told me that overall she had a wonderful time judging the contest. Her favourite part was reading stories from all over the world. The hardest part, of course, was narrowing down the list. That's true, of course, but I have to say that Sakina and Lara and Jonathan made it very easy this year. We conducted our final meeting to decide on the six stories that would make up the shortlist and our winner in a four-way FaceTime video conference with Jonathan in London, Sakina in Cincinnati, me in Manchester and Lara in a car somewhere, I think in Wales, with her mother. Her, mo <laughs> her mother driving, by the way. And it was enormously satisfying to be able to do that and reach a unanimous decision in a surprisingly short time. 
Sakina went on to say that she enjoyed reading stories from across cultures, across nations and across perspectives. It amazes me, she wrote, how many people were able to fit entire worlds into the space of 2,500 words. Part, of course, from the person who wrote 33,564 <laughs> words. The stories that made the long list and ultimately the short list, uh, Sakina continued, rose to the top because they were stories that stuck with us long after we had put them down. They were trying something new or different. They were filled with the right details to strike the right emotions. Lara added that the stories that grabbed her tended to have a quick sense of immediacy, confidence, and felt promising from the first line. Stories stood out if they showed original or experimental engagement with the form, or if they expanded what is possible in a short story. All the six shortlisted stories do this. They all expand what is possible in the short story. The story of the short story is richer, fuller, more vibrant, and more dramatic, more meaningful for all six of these stories having been written. I'd like to thank James, as always, whatever their pay limit isn't enough, and Ibtisan for her calm and efficient administration. Congratulations to all the shortlisted writers, thanks to my judges, my fellow judges, and thanks to all the shortlisted writers and to all the entrants and to you all for coming here tonight. Thank you.